I'm going to take a look at some shorter written questions now. Um, I'm going to use questions that came from the 2019 Paper 1, Financial Accounting, to get going. But some of these tips will apply whether you're doing Paper 1 or Paper 2. A lot of the information um, and the suggestions are quite generic. So what I plan to do then is obviously look at those questions um, and help you find ways to gain more marks. So a suggested approach then, how to answer these questions. Most of these six markers are going to be attached to a 14 mark computational question and will ask you to assess something. So quite often they'll say, um, give you some information and ask you to assess whether somebody's opinion is right or wrong or whether the business should do something. So to assess, just to remind you of that, is to consider or to make an informed judgment about the value, strengths or weakness of an argument, claim or topic. In a nutshell, you need to weigh up the pros and cons. And obviously, if you're going to assess something properly, you also need to make a judgment. So at the end, you need to say whether you are in favour or against something. So what we can look at then, numbers. Have we got any numbers? Now, as I just mentioned, this is going to come attached to a 14 mark computational question. You might have just done a cash flow or an income statement. So you can use some of those figures that have already been gleaned. What does that tell you about the size of the business? What does it tell you about their cash situation? Can they afford whatever they're thinking of doing? Um, and so on. Can you take those numbers a step further? So if it's asking you about ratios and you've just worked out profit, then can you calculate some of those ratios? Um, balance, we need to get some balance in this question. We need to assess both sides of the argument and always remember to build a chain of reasoning. So using connectives, taking some information that's been given to you in the question and then building upon that, so sort of saying what the consequences might be. Limitations, often we can um, identify limitations to the data, what extra information might be helpful in this scenario. Not always, sometimes you've got everything you need to be able to make that informed decision. Um, and then judgment, do not forget to make a judgment at the end, otherwise you will be restricting yourself to the lower level of the marking grid, which is not what you want. What do you think? Um, often no right or wrong answer, as long as it's a reasoned conclusion and follows on from the arguments that you've just developed um, in terms of pros and cons. So structure, balance. You need one paragraph of pros, one paragraph of cons. We're not writing more in piece here. It's only six marks um, and you've probably got less than a page of A4 to fit it onto. Evidence. What evidence can we glean from the scenario, from the question that we've just completed, you know, part A or part one of the question? What do we do there? What numbers have we got? From there. Don't just churn out generic points, you're not going to get marks for that. So we need numbers, we need opinions. If opinions have been stated in the scenario, then take that by all means, but remember no points for regurgitating what's being said. You need to do something else with that. You need to develop those points. Um, building the chain of reasoning is all part of that. Don't forget to use those connective words, connective phrases, um, such as um, however, um, that will lead to, because of, you know, that kind of thing. And then at the end, as I said before, judgment, please say yes or no, or right or wrong, and give a reason why. It needs to be a reasoned judgment, not just a straightforward yes or no. Okay, so the marking grid, I'm not going to go through this in any details, but just to identify a few points here, um, obviously nothing worthy of credit means no marks. But if we're stuck at level one, it's because our judgments have been asserted. So we've said yes or no, but we've not given any evidence as to why that would be. We've not provided a chain of reasoning at any point. So we've just got kind of bullet points almost. It's very fragmented. To get up to um, level two, our judgments are partially supported by evidence. So we've done some evaluation of the evidence, but it's a little bit unbalanced. So we might have come up with a whole load of pros, not enough cons. To get right to the top, it needs to be balanced, it needs to be clear, logical chain of reasoning um, throughout, and you need a judgment that's been you know, fully supported by that, that range of evidence. So let's take a look at some examples of these six markers that were in the 2019 exam. So the first one, Charlotte, was part of an incomplete records income statement question where there was some stolen cash, so you should have already been able to calculate that. Obviously, one of the problems with these six markers is that if you haven't been able to do the first part, the computational stuff, then you are going to really struggle to sort out the, uh, the six mark written question. So we do need to make sure that we're good at the computational stuff before we, we get on to these written questions. Um, but the question here is that Charlotte is thinking of introducing a computerized system which will record the cash and the inventory in and out of the business. It's going to cost £12,000. 
The new system records all sales to enable her to place orders automatically. So it's going to be fully automated, a stock control system that will presumably have a, a minimum level and then it will reorder things for Charlotte. So it's not doing anything else, it's not doing the year end accounts, it's just controlling the cash and the inventory. And we've been asked to assess whether Charlotte should purchase the new computerized system or not. So the process then, what are we being asked to do? Identify the pros and cons of buying the computer system. That's the assess part. And then make a recommendation. Should she buy the system? Yes or no. And why? So other considerations, are there any numbers, perhaps from the first part of the question that we can use? And are there any limitations to the data that we've been given? So is there anything else that we need to know? And obviously we're gonna be demonstrating that logical chain of reasoning, using connective words and phrases to improve our chances of getting the analysis mark. Without using connectives, you're not gonna to get to the AO3 marks. Okay, so the answer here, first par paragraph in favor of the um, computerized system. Introducing a computerized system to control cash and inventory will help to modernize Charlotte's business and make it more efficient. We can see that she suffered some stolen cash during the year. That came from the income statement. It was 300 pounds, so we're quantifying that. And although improving her cash management will not prevent theft in future, it may deter employees from stealing and identify problems much sooner. Um, improved inventory control will improve efficiency by reducing the amount of inventory held, thereby reducing the cost of storage and the chances of inventory becoming stolen, damaged, out of date, obsolete, that kind of thing. So that's the advantages to her. Disadvantages, obviously the large one is the £12,000 outlay, says so there it's a considerable amount for a business of Charlotte's size. Her income statement showed a profit of 22,885. And although the 12,000 pounds, if it's gonna last for a few years, will probably be treated as a non-current asset, so it won't directly impact profit. It does give an idea of how big the business is. Um, her average inventory was around 23,500, so I got that by adding opening and closing inventory and dividing by two. Um, and she had stolen cash of 300. There could be ongoing costs with staff training and software updates that would reduce Charlotte's profit in future. In addition, staff may be resistant to change and the computer system could be affected by viruses or hacking, although the likelihood of this could be reduced by protecting the data with strong passwords. So nice chain of reasoning building up there. Initially, it will be time consuming to input correct product line, or sorry, current product lines and inventory levels. In time, though, it will become much less time consuming to update the information as Charlotte and her staff become familiar with the software. So though it looks like the second paragraph, the against is larger, it actually kind of counters some of those arguments. So it's saying, well, yes, we've got some potential disadvantages like the cost and the time it's going to take. But it's pointing out you know, a few benefits linking there with um, what might happen in future. So overall, we need to make a judgment. And I've decided that she should invest in the new computerized system because it will modernize her business and ultimately save her time and money. But you could decide that actually you think that she shouldn't invest in it because £12,000 is just too much of an outlay for a business the size of Charlotte's. Totally up to you. No right or wrong answer with this one. Okay, the next part of this then, 15.3 was attached to the Nando question um, about a retiring partner. So Nando was retiring, and this one was on professional ethics. So it says that Nando's personal accountant was involved in the revaluation of the partnership's assets when he decided to leave. And we have to assess the ethics of why it might not be appropriate for Nando's personal accountant to have been involved in the valuation of the partnership's assets. Now it's asking us to assess the ethics. So if we don't know our professional ethics, objectivity, integrity and all the rest of it, we really aren't going to be able to do a very good job of answering that. We could apply a common sense approach and probably get two marks out of six saying, well, you know, it could be a kind of conflict of interest here with Nando's personal accountant being involved. But actually, it would make sense to have all the partners accountants involved to get a, you know, a consensus. Um, and we don't know, we're, that's one of the limitations of the data, we don't know whether or not that actually happened. So assessing, so why it might have been a good idea, why it might not have been a good idea, and then coming up with some sort of judgment. So as a professional, uh, Nando's accountant should always be straightforward and honest in their dealing with clients. They should not allow bias or conflict of interest to affect their work for clients, and they should not be unduly influenced by others when exercising judgment. So those are the basics, acting professionally, as an accountant. Um, Nando's accountant could be accused of compromising the professional ethics of objectivity, integrity, and confidentiality if his advice was biased or contained incorrect 
valuations. Um, however, there might not be a problem if the advice given was unbiased and the valuations were carried out by an independent third party. We don't know if we had a surveyor or a valuer um, do those, those valuations that were in the first part of the question. We don't know if the other partners agreed to the valuations and were happy with them or whether they sought advice elsewhere, so that could have been from their own accountants. We also don't know whether the accountant has explained their relationship to Nando to the other partners or whether Nando has explained the relationship and, and mentioned that his, his accountant is involved in the valuations. So those are some limitations that have been um, identified. Um, I'm coming up saying that actually I think that the advice probably was unbiased because if you look back at the, the calculations that were done on Nando's retirement, some of the assets actually decreased in value, which wouldn't have been in his interest. If he was retiring, he would have wanted to see um, an increase in the value of everything to make sure that the money he got out of the partnership when he left was as much as possible. So I'm saying that the figures calculated on Nando's retirement show that some assets decreased in value. This suggests that the advice given was probably unbiased. But I mean, you could equally say there really isn't enough um, information here to make an informed decision without talking to the other partners um, and their accountants. But uh, whatever you do, make a judgment and make sure that it is justified. So three mark questions. Now I'm just going to mention these. Often these are just like little six mark questions, just half a six mark question. There's often only one thing to discuss. It's more to do, usually it's in section A, so it's more to do with just explaining something. So the example in this 2019 paper um, was question 11 in section A, and it said that many businesses sell goods on credit to their customers. Explain one reason why it's important for these businesses to make a provision for doubtful debts. So when we're looking at something like this, this is the marking grid for that. What we're aiming to do is get a clear and thorough explanation showing knowledge of a reason, in this case, for creating a provision for doubtful debts. So what would be the reason? We could be thinking about the accounting concepts of prudence, Consistency would apply here, applying the same rate each year. We're reducing the value of an asset. We're reducing trade receivables. And we are recording the increase in the provision for doubtful debts as an expense, thereby reducing profits as well. So we've got all that information we know that we can bring to this question. So we need to include a definition. Let's explain what a provision for doubtful debts actually is. How does it work? And why is it needed? So maybe throw in some accounting concepts there or showing a true and fair view. Um, at the end of the year. So the answer that I've written here, a provision for doubtful debts is my explanation part shows, um, sorry, a provision for doubtful debts allows for the possibility that some of the firm's trade receivables balances may not be paid, i.e. they may become irrecoverable debts. So rather than wait for that to happen, we're creating a provision by deducting a small percentage from the trade receivables at the end of the year and showing that as an expense on the income statement. And then in future years, the provision will either be increased or decreased according to the value of trade receivables. So there's a brief, brief explanation of how it works. And then I've said that this is in accordance with the accounting concept of prudence, as it ensures that the value of assets and the profit are not overstated. And to be honest, that will do. I mean, just make sure if we just go back to the previous slide with these three markers, try and include a definition. So explain whatever it is you've been asked, what that actually is, how it works, mm -hmm. and why you, you need to do it. OK, so hopefully that's given you some ideas as to how to answer these little six and three mark questions. Um, and as soon as I get time, I will try and record some more videos going through um, 2020, 2021 papers, paper one and some of the paper two questions, too. Thanks very much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe.